just long to the Lord. I just long be song from mountains I can see. I just long to the Lord. Sing hallelujah. My eyes will chill from your spirit. Your Savior now has come. He has rejoiced. Sorrows rejoice. Welcome you and Facebook out there. Um, here at Faith Family, we are an open and affirming congregation. We would like nothing more than all God's children. We say all, that's a big capital A, capital L, capital L. All people are welcome here. We have a little saying that goes, no matter where you are in your life's journey or where you are on your spiritual journey, you are welcome here again, everyone. All are welcome. Um, here in a little bit, we're going to do communion together. I, I see Jackie took care of me like she always does. Um, so if uh, you and Facebook would like to gather up the elements, crackers, bread, uh, wine, juice, or whatever the drink is, um, we will bless them together and we will partake of communion together. Um, I don't have anything. Everybody's kind of stuck. Did everybody have a hard time getting out of bed this morning? Amen. Oh, yeah. It's one of those. I think it's the face of that. I know you did. You come in here with a smile on your face. Man, he's like, oh, how are you doing? <laughs> but, that, but that cheered me up a little bit. Okay, so, thank you. Um, let's go ahead and start with our, our call to worship. Humble yourself in the sight of the Lord. <coughs> says, oh God, hear our prayers. Thank you, God, for waking us up today. This we pray. Oh God, hear our prayers. We celebrate Christ embodied in human form. We pray for God's blessing on the church, the world, and all creation. This we pray. Oh God, hear our prayers. Loving God, we pray that your example of teaching with confidence and authority built up your church in love. May all church leaders and teachers 
honoring your instruction and model your inclusive ways. This we pray. O oh God, hear our prayer. Renewing God, we pray for all creation, that waterways flow clean and clear, natural spaces are protected, and our planet is healed. Let us commit to thoughtful care of the earth. This we pray. O oh God, hear our prayer. Justice seeking God, we pray for those in government and communities that they lead with honor and mindfulness. May they remember their covenants and be upright in their ways. This we pray. O oh God, our prayer. Compassionate God, we pray for all in need, especially those who have no rejection and who struggle with long term illnesses or chronic pain. Those without access to safe housing or health care. Or who may suffer. We ask prayers for Amy DeMiles' mother who fell and broke her hip this week. We ask prayers for all those dealing with various addictions. We ask travel prayers for Gail as she flies in today for me. Prayers for Mike and Donnie for good health. Prayers for the extended family in Arkansas and who are, who are struggling with the unexpected passing of their Monte. Matriarch, Bill Stepper. We ask prayers for Sean's nephew, Kedar, who was in a terrible accident, and the grandmother, who was 90, broke her ankle in three places. We ask prayers of praise for Barb's improvement to be with us today. Roy asked, Roy, Randy asked prayer for healing for his brother Mike's leg, whose end is facing kidney dialysis. We pray, though, O oh God, we pray for all those who we have been asked to pray and those whose intentions we hold in our heart. This we pray. Oh God, our prayer. Still speaking, God, we pray for our pastor, our congregation, for its educators and caregivers, for its ushers, for its council members, and for all those who do so many things to make Sunday worship and church a reality. This we pray. Oh God, hear our prayer. Eternal God, we are root for God. We remember all who have been teachers, mentors, and companions in the church and in our lives. We pray for Jill and her family on the passing of Jill's stepmother this past week. We trust that all who have passed will rest in your loving care. God of grace, receive our prayer. This we pray. Loving God, we cannot comprehend the suffering of those who live in darkness there is war, terrorism, cruelty, and injustice, often brought about by greed and indifference to the suffering. We stand with our brothers and sisters, and we pray with them. We pray with the children who are too exhausted to laugh or cry, who know little of life except hunger and waiting. We pray for young women during the next generation for safety and childbirth. We pray with the men who once strong, are now weakened with chronic ill health and no place to call home. We pray with many, with many aid agencies who work to bring help and healing to the silent poor, to bring about self-reliance, cooperation, and effective health programs. Loving God, we ask for peace in those places, asking that you will raise up leaders and those with influence to always be guided by the Holy Spirit to give wisdom, understanding, and discernment. This we pray. Oh God, be with us this week as we go about in our neighborhoods, as we spread your love in all that we do. This we pray. Now is the time in our service when we get to share God's love and peace with one another. Please stand, set, whatever. Fist bump, hug, high five, low five. I just share God's love with one another. Love and peace to you out there on Facebook. Feel free to type it on the bottom. Love and peace, everyone. Love and peace.
supposed to let our good deeds be shown. You're supposed to do that. Don't let your left hand do what you're right. And then I got to thinking, well, how are people going to know? See, how are there's an inspire anybody. There you go. Exactly. You and know. that's why we publish what we have, is to inspire other people. Um, go ahead. I, I'll just try and inspire you while I'm talking to you. Um, but we, we do it not to say, look at what we did. We did all of this and that. And no, it's about inspiring others to, hey, this is what we're doing. Would you like to join us? Or do you have an idea for a ministry that where you can do good deeds in the community and, and, and whatnot? So this idea of publicizing it is simply that. It's to say, hey. Hopefully, this inspires you to do a good deed as well. Now, since it is our ministry moment, I want to put out there that um, if you have a ministry that you think you would like to start, bring that to us. Um, and, and we will do all that we can to support you, get you started in that pet ministry. Um, Jill came to us. I, I never remember. 
never, I never forget that. And she had those, and I said, yeah, that's a great idea. I'd like that support your ministry. What can we do? And we support her. We put her, her stuff on Facebook so, so other people can be inspired and people know the Food Angel Ministry is, is, is a strong ministry in our community. Um, another one was, was we call it the, um, and you saw some of the pictures, um, John Chisholm Memorial Boots and Blankets. Now John would come and he would gather up all kinds of clothes and take to the homeless people. And, and it, we just continue that because it's such a wonderful ministry. Another one, and I don't know if you knew this or not, but Sue Clark, remember Sue Clark? She was um, she works at Mintz Elementary and she got us involved into helping Mintz now twice a year, you know, in the in the spring or excuse me, in the fall, we gather up book bags and everything and uh, and help them with the with their school supplies. And then Christmas we also um, uh, help them with the Christmas gifts to make sure that they have Christmas as well. And one of the things that I uh, want to do this year in the spring right before they get out of school we want to try to gather up some school or some school some summer clothes for those kids and see these are all ministries that people have ideas and they come to us and we as the family the faith family we have encouraged them and we facilitate them if you have a a ministry that you would like send the thing forward and talk with the council and say hey i want to do it Got to get youth in here, but we've got a youth ministry um, here in this church. So what I'm trying to say is, if you have a ministry or you're looking for a ministry, come to us and maybe we can fit you in with something you like with one of our ministries that we already have, or maybe you could start coming up with us. I think that everyone should have some sort of ministry. Your salvation, I always said this, your salvation is between you and God. Christianity, your mission is amongst the people. Thank you. Psalm 111. Hallelujah. What the heck does that mean? It means praise the Lord. I will give thanks to you, Adonai, with all my heart, my whole heart, in the meeting of the just and your assembly, in the congregation. Great are your works to be studied by all who love them, who delight in them. Full honor and majesty are your works, and your justice endures forever. You make us remember your wonders. You are compassionate and love, gracious and merciful. You provide food for those who revere you, keeping your covenant ever in mind. You reveal to your people the power of your actions by giving them the lands of the nations as their inheritance. The works of your hands are truth and justice, and all your precepts are sure standing firm forever and ever, and carried out uprightly and faithfully. You have sent deliverance to your people and established your covenant forever. Your name is holy and awe-inspiring. Reverence for Adonai is the beginning of wisdom, and those who have it prove themselves wise. Your praise will last forever. Thank you, Wesley. One of the, I just realized uh, Mike's name, Mike Dottie's name was on the list. Was it? Okay. I, I, it was in my own. It was on my list. I hope I read it. Okay. <laughs> Mike, Mike's a little under the weather, and he, he was supposed to read today, but Wesley uh, filled in for him. Thank you, Wesley. Uh, hallelujah! I always like that. What's the difference between Hallelujah and Hallelujah? Well, 
an H, thank you. <laughs> so so it, it, just so you know, okay. In, in Greek, in Greek, there's a breathing sign. It looks like a little uh, a little uh, comma, but it goes above a vowel or, or at the first letter of a word. And if it's a comma and it's facing to the front of the word, it's not pronounced. But if it's facing the opposite way, it's pronounced. So it should actually be hallelujah. You get the breath sound. Ha. And yet, if you look at it, there's no H there, unless you know how to read Greek a little bit. So, the difference between Alleluia and Hallelujah is a sigh, an H at the beginning. So, anyway, so you know, there's no difference between them. Yeah, it's a, it's a little confusing. How much would you know about God if you were completely on your own? without anyone telling you what God is like. This would include the Bible. <coughs> I'm missing my Bible. It's in the middle. Huh? Where's my Bible? Including the Bible, because the Bible is written by people telling you what God is like. Sense, so they're there. That's that's what the, the, the Bible is. So, how much would you know about God if you did not have someone else telling you what it was about? Could you could you look out into the world, into the creation, and discern God for yourself? What about relationships? A relationship with God. Relationship with the community. See, we're not in a vacuum. We're constantly being talked about um, God and God's will. Not too much unlike um, what we're trying to do today. That's what the Bible is about. People trying to understand this ineffable, unfathomable God and trying to relate it to ourselves and to our community. We talked about this a little in Sunday school, how we used to prescribe if something bad happened to us, oh, it was, is it a demon or is it God trying to tell us something? So we always try to and that's what the Bible is it's about. It's about trying to understand God and trying to understand how the, the relationship between you and God is and how that relates to our community. But see, some people have different ideas about God. Where do they get those ideas? How dare we look at we look at Upon this difference with suspicion, sometimes with contempt. If someone comes and they have a different idea of God, we want to say, whoa, where did you get that idea from? And sometimes we even say, ooh, you heretic. Tertullian did. Tertullian was a second, late second, early third century uh, church leader, um, bishop. And he believed in a Christianity that didn't ask questions. He didn't see, he, he, he didn't want people to seek God. After all, the church had already been established. Jesus had already came. The Christ has been revealed. And we know everything. And you just had to listen to your bishops or your priests. He believed in a Christian. He believed that, according to oh, some said him, according to him, uh, to ask questions was the way of a heretic. For for him, there is no need to be seeking God. The point of 
was seeking was to find. And the purpose of finding was so that you could believe. Therefore, since you have faith and you are part of the church, then to continue seeking to understand or to grow closer to God was sheer obstinance. Just do what you're told. Just do what you're told. After all, the only thing that you need to do is to listen to your priest or your bishop and then do what you're told. Not a way to live if you are a person of curiosity. I want to know. It doesn't mean I'm not faithful. It does not mean I don't believe. I just want to understand. I'm sure that I would have been uh, deemed a heretic. And in a lot of his writings, that's what Tertullian did. He called a lot of people heretics. Um, if I lived in the third century, yes, I would be. Another person more like me, uh, Roger Williams. Do you know who Roger Williams no, nope. no. Nope. Roger Williams was the founder of Rhode Island. Roger Williams lived in uh, 16, 1630s. 1630s, Roger Williams got kicked out of Massachusetts. He was a preacher in Massachusetts. And Mass uh, Massachusetts Bay uh, Congregation colony, um, actually decided that his, his opinions were too, uh, too off base, and so they asked him to kindly leave, and when he didn't, they basically threw them out. But he got sick, and it was winter, and they had compassion on him, and they said, you can stay until spring, but just don't preach that opinion stuff anymore. And so what did he do? He preached his and one day they come to his house and they knock on his door and they're going to literally physically remove him from Massachusetts. But he knew it was coming and he went down. And he went down and he stayed with some Native Americans uh, in the southern part of Massachusetts until spring when he went into what is now called Rhode Island. In Rhode Island, he went and he purchased some land from the Native Americans. Did you catch that? purchased land. See, that was one of the reasons why he was kicked out of Massachusetts. He didn't believe that the king had the right to make a charter and give land that did not belong to him to the people living. He said that was the Native Americans' land, and you should purchase it from them. Therefore, that charter that you have for your colony is null and void. And so when he moved down to Rhode Island, he did just that himself. He went and he purchased the land from the Native Americans. Probably didn't know what they were doing, but at least he had the right mentality. He built a place called Providence, um, Providence, Providence, Rhode Island. Oh, it was Providence, um, Thank you. Now, somebody that knows history, to, to keep me straight, thank you. <laughs> Providence Plantation. And from there, the course through the state of the colony and then the state of the Americans. But Williams was, uh, was also probably the first one to bring the Baptist church to America. He was a very pious man. Um, as a matter of fact, he was so pious, he questioned other people's salvation. He said, there's only two people that you can honestly and truly know of salvation. And that is yourself and your spouse. And then in his diaries, he wrote that he had some uh, reservations about his spouse. <laughs> All the same. He did establish a call, the colony of Rhode Island that became uh, the state of Rhode Island. And uh, on this foundation, he based it on religious freedom. Rhode 
Rhode Island was the first colony, the first place that welcomed people of diverse religious backgrounds. Two men, two different approaches to leading people in spirituality and religion. I have some props here today because, and, and I, I can't, I can't do props without thinking of what, what's the guy's name? The red hair, the comedian. Carrot Top. Yeah, I should have known that. Carrot Top. So he always used to do that. He'd pull out a prop and say something crazy and put it down. Well, here I go. So I want to talk a little bit about theology for a second. This is my theology book when I was an undergraduate. It's by Elmer Towns, Dr. Elmer Towns, who's at Liberty University. Well, that's now. But um, he wrote a theology, and it's a systematic theology. I'll get that in a second. But um, I took his class, and guess what? Yeah, I kind of wonder about professors like that who have you read their own books as part of the class. But he wrote this, and we read this. And it's called Theology for Today. Now, my issue with this, it's not theology proper. Theology proper. The word theology means theo, God, ology, study of, so the study of God. But this doesn't study God. This studies the Bible and what we can understand about God from the Bible. So this would be better um, term of uh, bibliology, not theology. And that's my problem with the idea of theology. Christians want to own everything. And so we say theology, we just mean Christian theology. And that's this book. This is a lot older book. This is by James Strong, and it's systematic theology. And all systematic theology means is that they take in all the subjects and put them together and see how they relate together. Instead of reading the Bible and coming to an understanding as you go through the Bible, this puts all of them into categories. And so you can study a category and understand God that way. But guess what? Once again, even though it says theology, it's more a study of the Bible and not now, Erickson, I like Erickson. Erickson's a little bit different, and you notice his title, I don't know if you can see it, it says Christian Theology. Ah, so we're getting somewhere. We're not just studying the Bible and trying to say that's theology, and if you don't, you know, don't understand it, then go away. No, it's saying this is what Christians understand about God. Now, Erickson goes a little bit further. He talks about some of the other beliefs, such as um, some of it, what Tertullian would have deemed as heretics, and he goes on to explain how they think, and then he goes and, and refutes them and says they're wrong. But still, we have three different books that I've studied theology out of, and not one of them has looked as we see here in our psalm. The psalmist looks Talks about God through what he sees in creation. That is theology. When you say God is, and you can see what God is external from just the Bible, because this can only tell us so much. But God is so much bigger than just this one. This book is great. The way I view this book, it's kind of, um, there's a cute saying. You know, all heard the cute saying, what, you know, Bible is an acronym. Bible stands for, yeah, it's an acronym. The B stands for basic instruction before leaving earth. It's kind of cute. Thank you for laughing. <laughs> But that's, that's it's, it's more of a, a guidebook. 
Because these are people that have gone before us and they've asked questions. What is God like? We can't see God. So what is God like? Well, we can look at his creation and that's what we see the psalmist do. He looks at the creation, God's creation, and he sees God's fingerprints all over creation. And he comes up with the idea that God is loving and God is from looking at creation. Now, we, we point this out because when the psalmist wrote this, he didn't have a huge Bible like this. He probably had a scroll or two or three that he could look at. But Joshua, yeah, it probably, it probably didn't even have that. Now, this, now I'm, being, I'm being fair here. That much they probably had. That's the law, the Torah. And so they probably had that much, but they probably didn't go around reading it like we read our Bibles today. So where does he get this from? Because he was a studier of theology, a studier of God. Wherever he could find some picture, some understanding of God. And I think that that's what we need here today. See, I, I equate the Bible with, with these books. Here's one more promise. One more promise. So this one is Tuscany and Florence. Um, oh, this is when we went on the bike trail, the, the Radwagen um, in, in Germany. We rode our bikes all over Germany. Uh, oh, this is a tourist guide for Iraq. That's an interesting story. When I was over there, one of the we went to um, Babylon, and uh, the... Uh, professor at uh, Iraq, uh, what is it, Baghdad University, um, gave us a tour, and he told us that after the war was over and everything, we need to come back and, and uh, do a tour with our families. I was like, okay, I don't think that's going to happen. But anyway, he gave us, he got a book, and it shows, these are people that went before London, Prague, but these are books of people with experience. People that live in these places and have visited these places, and these are their experiences. This is what you will see. This is what happens. Kind of like this book. This book tells us about God, people's experiences with God, people's understanding about God. And then we, as we read it, we can relate it back to our lives. But that's not God. God is bigger than this, as we heard a couple weeks ago. But the point is, God can be seen everywhere. God can be seen everywhere. But when we look to others, not just the Bible, but what about people that have different understandings? When you're in the when you're in the military, you had the Protestant chapel, you had the Anglican chapel, and you had the Catholic chapel. Now, there's some broke off from that. You had the Pentecostals that would come late on Sunday. But they kind of grouped it all together. You were either Protestant or you were Catholic. And yet, we weren't. I had, I had uh, chaplains that were Reformed chaplains. Baptist chaplain, uh, Church of Christ, Disciples of Christ chaplain, and a Seventh-day Adventist chaplain. Now, all these people never agree on everything, or on very little, actually. But yet, they were all there together, and they all had different perspectives, and they had different experiences. And see, when we bring those experiences together, then we have a better understanding of God. Even the Bible has people's different perspectives. This is the NIV Bible. The Pew Bibles, we have the Pew Bibles out there. The Pew Bibles, that's the Revised Standard Bible. Some people use the New Revised Standard. Our text, I, I do a conglomeration between the, the, new, the new Revised Standard and uh, the all-inclusive Bible translation. 
these are people giving their interpretation of what the Bible says. And so we're not just we're not just um, going about it and doing like Tertullian wants you to do, not asking questions. We're looking around. Are you guys familiar with horse racing? You ever notice that some of the horses, what do they put on them? Those blinders. What are those blinders for? Keep them focused. Focus on what? Where the jockey wants them to go. So they're not looking over here, they're not looking over here. They're running and they're straight ahead. Don't ask questions, don't look around, do what we tell you. That's kind of the, the, the attitude that Tertullian had. We want to take off those blinders. We want to look around. We want to see what we can see. I remember when, when the reason why we have all these uh, books on uh, travel and everything. When we were in Germany, we would buy the books, and we would read up on, on where we were going to go, and we would go there, and we would just get lost. We, not, not literally, but we would just go there and just encompass, let, let, let the whole place encompass us, and do what we learned from the guidebooks. We didn't go there and get pulled into a tour that took you places and showed you things that you didn't want to see, take you to little tourist traps that would try to get you to spend their money there. We went there and we went on our own. We just, from what we read and what we understood about the place, thank you, this one time, we'd just come out of the Colosseum. We went into the Colosseum, um, come out of the Colosseum, and uh, there's a little food truck, a little uh, snack food truck. And I walked up to it and I said, um, can I get a Coke? And he goes, yeah, sure. And he grabs a Coke, twists it, opens the Coke, and he hands it to me. And before I could reach out and grab it, he said, that's six euros. And my hand shot back. And I said, no, thank you. But about that time, six, six euros, what, what's six euros? About, about seven, eight dollars for a Coke. Just a regular Coke. Anyway, so we went on down the road and we were following the map in one of our books and we turned down this, I said, we go down this little alleyway, we're going to go right over there and we'll be right at uh, Circus Circus or Circus, uh, the, 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 the horse racing track. And so we cut down through this alley and right there was this old mom and pop rodeo. And they had these little pints of strawberries in there. So we went in there and I bought a pint of strawberries and two coats, one for her, one for me. And it cost me three euro. Did you catch that? Six euro for one coat at the tourist trap, but at the mom and pop store. See, that's what happens when you can look at a guy, look at someone that goes before you, right? And you kind of follow their leads. As I was reading and preparing for this, um, reading this uh, psalm, I could not think, I could not not think, double negative, um, of Dale. Y'all remember Dale Kimberly? Yeah. yeah. Dale. Dale once told me, he, he used to play uh, music music for us um, at the old place, and he, he would do the music, and uh, he was great. He played a little mandolin. What was it? He used to call it something. Mandolin. He had a ukulele and a mandolin and a guitar. Anyway, he played all those. He played so many. But uh, anyway, he'd come up to me every once in a while and he would say, "Hey, I'm not going to be here uh, next next week for the service. I'm going to my other church." And when he first said that, I was like, "Oh, did you go to another church?" And then he told me, he said, "My other church is. He liked to go hiking. He liked to go out and, and then hike. He, he did at one point he did the Appalachian Trail." But anyway, he, he would go out and he would hike, and he's called that his other church because it was him alone, away with, with nature and God. And so I thought that that's that's really good, his other church. And I think that captures the the, the idea of the psalmist, how um, the psalmist can look out at the beautiful creation, and he can see God's finger.
just with the monthly wages. So I looked up something. The idea of do not be afraid. Because think about it. Straying away from what you've always known. Straying away from what you've always been taught. Going ahead and standing in someone else's shoes and looking at their perspective on God. That's scary. That's scary. Sometimes I think that the reason why the church is, is, is I'm shrinking is because the people that are in the church are the people that are holding on to their tradition. They're holding on to their childhood, what they've always been taught about God. And they're a little bit afraid to look at God in a different perspective. But what are we told so many times in the Bible? Do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. I looked that up. Guess how many times that, that it's said in the New Testament? Do not be afraid. 365. Are you? I, 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 I like, no, no, that cannot be. Do not be afraid. So there's a, there's a total sermonette right there. 365 times you can open up your Bible and it'll tell you, do not be afraid. Every day, Every day you can be told, do not be afraid. But do not be afraid. Do not be afraid to question God or, that is, people's understanding of God. Do not be afraid to look at that God from a different perspective. Do not be afraid to ask questions. Here's the thing. If God, if it is the truth, that perspective on if it is true, then no matter what question you ask, it's still going to be true. Does that make sense? If you ask a question about the validity of something that we say about God, that is not going to change the true answer. The true answer is still going to be true. See, I would love for everyone, whether you know it or not, you are, but I would love for everyone to be a theologian, to study God, to look at God. The psalmist says, great are your works to be studied by all who love them, all that love God as well. I would love for everyone to be a theologian. A, a, a deeper theologian. Because I believe that everyone is a theologian. And you say, well, what about the atheist? Guess what? The atheist is a theologian too. They thought about God, they looked at their experiences, and they said, there is no God. They studied God, therefore they are a theologian. Everyone is a theologian. If you just, what is the depth of your study? I would love it for everyone to be a very deep theologian and try to understand God. Not by studying the Bible, but poets are great theologians. If you listen to them and their uh, uh, talk about the, 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 the world around them, the majesty, the beauty of it, they're, they're talking about God. But if you want to understand God, then you have to open yourself up. You need to do not be afraid. You need to take off the blinders and see God in the everyday. See God in the everyday. The psalmist opened him, themselves up and they saw God as loving and compassionate, gracious and merciful, a God that is faithful, who keeps oaths, covenants that are made will last forever. The psalmist gleaned from the study of the world around them a 
and they come to the conclusion about God. Not what other people said, but about God to them. Because that's where it begins. When God starts to make sense to you, then your understanding starts to grow. And those are See, we can see God in every day if we do just that. We work for God in the everyday. Let us take off those blinders and truly see God's face. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let us sing the dog song with you. Praise this small token of what we give back that all may know Father you are the creator of the world and you have created a world of plenty a world that is enough help us to learn to share that all would be fed all would be clothed and all would have a shelter to lay down under to sleep we ask a blessing upon this. We ask a blessing upon the givers. And we ask a blessing upon those that will receive the good gifts. In Christ's name, amen.
preparation and consecration. On the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took bread and he blessed it and he broke it and he gave it to his friends and he said, take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Afterwards, after the supper, he took the cup and he gave thanks and he said, drink this, all of you. This is the cup of the new covenant, which is poured out for you and for many. Whenever you drink it, do this in remembrance of me. Mighty and gracious God, we now celebrate the sacraments of your Christ, the bringer of your grace. By means of this holy bread and cup, this holy meal, we show forth the example of his life and proclaim his resurrection until he comes again. Gather us by this holy communion into one body, the body of Christ. Make us a living witness for your love and your forgiveness to the world. By Christ and with him and in him, in all unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, loving God, now and forever. Let us join together in saying the Lord's Prayer, the one that he taught us. As we do, let, um, let's use the, um, the name of the divine, whatever is closest to your heart. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For you are the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I thought that I should just come forward. Um, we will take communion as we've been doing. Um, please line up on the right side after you take communion. If you would like a blessing, I will be over on, the, on your left side. And you can reserve to me.
God, we thank you for your grace. We thank you because we know who we are. And we know that we are not perfect. But you look down and you see us. And you say, I love you just as you are. That is your grace. Thank you for your grace. In Christ's name. So, some announcements. Uh, today is the uh, council meeting after after service today. Probably give about 20 minutes for hospitality, and then we'll go into our uh, council meeting. Uh, let's see. Bible studies are underway still. Uh, every uh, every poor service at 9.30 every Sunday morning. So we encourage you to join us for that. Next Sunday, we will be doing a breakfast that we do uh, the Sunday school. So if you have any questions, bring them to the, to the breakfast. Um, I did send out some, some questions that I asked everybody to, to kind of answer for themselves. If you want to bring uh, answers or your ideas about those questions, those would be good. If you, if you don't know what I'm talking about, look at the uh, newsletter. So at 9.30, we will have a breakfast instead of the Bible study. Instead of the Bible study. Yes. Well, it's actually a combination yeah. kind of breakfast yeah. Bible study discussion kind of thing. Sure. All right. That sounds like a lot of fun. So we'll, we'll be doing absolutely. That. We'll be doing that the first Sunday of every month. Okay. Instead of going to Bible study, we'll do that so we can get together and just, just talk about our own perspectives on what, how we understand God. And maybe we can all be enlightened. Well, I hope everybody out there in, in Facebook land heard that because that is going to be very exciting. That's a pretty cool idea. Thank you. All right, looking forward to that. Um, let's see. So that takes care of the first Sunday of the month. On the second Sunday of the month, which is February the 11th, we'll be starting our social justice awareness meetings. <coughs> uh, so be aware of that. That will be after service on the second Sunday of the month. Um, and that will alternate with the sacred conversation meetings, which will begin on the second Sunday in March. Let's see. Uh, trying to put these in order instead of going out of, going out of order. Um, I guess the Super Bowl party kind of falls in there somewhere, right? February 11th. All right. So let's hear about the Super Bowl party. We have Super Bowl pool, uh, dollar squares available. So catch her if you want to get in on that contest. And tickets, I have nine tickets left. A maximum of 25 are available, $25 each. All right. I hope we all heard that as well. Okay. Um, third Sunday of the month will be the um, food distribution Sunday that we have for, and I have got to March 3rd yet. <laughs> and part of the uh, food distribution uh, we are having a, a bingo. Excuse me, guys. I'm really not doing this today. Take a deep breath. Okay. All right. Going back to food pantry is the third Sunday of the month, and in on the third of March, we are going to be having a bingo to support the food pantry. So keep that up on your calendars as well. Are there any uh, specific needs for the food pantry? Not at this time. Okay, great. Good people. Thank you very much. Um, how are we for hospitality volunteers? Do we need volunteers for February? Please check the list in the back. There's a, a, a sign up sheet in the back for hospitality. And thank you for those who have already volunteered this month and a great job that you guys have been doing. We really appreciate that. I don't see anything. I don't think so. <laughs> Some days it's just been like five and a half hours. Yeah. Some days I wish I could just do that. Yeah. <laughs> so come up into the circle. Okay. 
Ash Wednesday. When is Ash Wednesday? Wednesday. Two weeks. Is this in two weeks? Is that wow. Yes. Um, just so you know, we are doing a, a service here for Ash Wednesday. It is the 14th, so come here to Ash Wednesday's service and then take your sweetheart out to... to what time is that? The service will be at 7.30. 7.30. The reason is I'm trying to get all the, the rush hour traffic off the roads and get you here yeah, in a reasonable time without without lots of traffic. So I, I think if I made it earlier, um, you probably wouldn't be able to make it because of the traffic unless you started out like before you even get off work or something. I don't know. But anyway, 7:30 uh, uh, February 14th, which is also uh, Valentine's Day, we will do a um, Ash Wednesday. Service. Thank you. Thank you for all that. benediction of encouragement and love for one another and we will conclude the service with that. Christ has no body but ours, no hands nor feet nor wheels but ours. Ours are the visions through which Christ's compassion is to look out on this world. Ours are the feet and the wheels which Christ goes about doing good and ours are the hands which which Christ blesses us now and blesses us all. Thank <laughs> you.